Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Love, and I am the National Program Manager at the Canadian Parks and Recreation Association. Joining me today on this webinar is my colleague, MJ Akande. And as well, we're thrilled to introduce our three guest speakers here to present this webinar on engaging women during and after pregnancy in physical activity and recreational sport. CPRA is the Canadian Parks and Recreation Association. We are the national organization dedicated to realizing the full potential of parks and recreation as a major contributor to healthy communities and vibrancy. CPRA is a voice. Over its 60 year history, we have been a national voice for the parks and recreation sector, advancing the collective interests of our members. We're also a community dedicated to the well being of people, communities, and natural and built environments. CPRA is also a resource and provides services for our members and partners that cultivate dialogue, learning, and innovation. Our collective strength is the network of provincial and territorial parks and recreation associations that make up the CPRA membership. We also are governed by a board of directors. We have provincial and territorial staff members, volunteers, government partners, allied sector partners, as well as volunteers that help us move our goals forward. CPRA has an office staff of approximately eight people that ebbs and flows a little bit depending on our projects, and we all work virtually, so we are spread out across the country. Although our staff work remotely, the main office of CPRA is located on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Mohawk First Nations. We acknowledge the historical oppressions of lands, cultures, and of the original peoples in which we now know as Canada and we aim to contribute to the healing and decolonizing journey that we all share together. Recently, CPRA introduced The Bench, and The Bench is a new online community and a place for the sector to meet and grow together. The Bench features resources, events, discussion groups, portals, and professional development opportunities, and will soon feature a benefits hub and a job board. We encourage you to sign up to The Bench this is sort of a screenshot of what the platform looks like. And in a moment, you'll see a short video featuring the bench. In 2019, CPRA was awarded funding by the Government of Canada to address gender equity in recreational sport. This is part of the Government of Canada's goal to increase participation and retention of women and girls and achieve gender equity in sport at every level. So there are four priority populations that our project looks at, including girls aged 9 to 15, new mums, postnatal women, women who are 55 and up, and women and girls and non-binary folks with intersecting identity factors. As part of this project, CPRA has delivered and designed toolkits, which will be starting to roll out this fall. So take a look on our website. We have a workshop series. We have webinars such as this one. There's some high five training if you're familiar with that program, as well as a community grants initiative. All of the information is on our website, but I'll just go into a little bit more detail about a few of these pieces. High Five Sport is a module that you may be familiar with. It's a four-hour training opportunity that has moved online in light of COVID, looking at working with children ages 4 to 12. And as part of this project, we've enhanced the High Five Sport module as a whole to bring a gender equity lens to the training. And we've also developed four complementary modules, one that addresses each of our priority populations for this project. So this is a free training opportunity subsidized by the Sport Canada and by this project. 
you can register to take it. And for those of you who have coaching certification, you can earn some NCCP credits for taking these courses. Our community grants initiative, many of you may be familiar with this piece of the project as well. Over the last two years, we have funded over 120 community level projects that engage women and girls in a variety of different sport and recreation opportunities. Over $700,000 has been invested in the program since that time. And we just recently had a call for funding for community grants and projects for this fiscal year. So all of the information can be found on our website, cpra.ca. And again, all of this is funded by Sport Canada and the Government of Canada. Today, we are here to talk about physical activity and recreational sport for postnatal and new mothers. So with me today, I would like to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker will be Dr. Michelle Matola. She is the director of the R. Samuel McLaughlin Foundation um, Exercise and Pregnancy Lab at Western University, which is one of the first labs in North America that specializes in the area of exercising pregnant and postpartum women. Michelle is an anatomist and exercise physiologist who for the past 20 years has conducted research on the efforts of maternal exercise on both the mother and the developing fetus. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Erin, for the uh, great introduction. And I'd like to thank Krista and the CPRA for inviting me here today to talk about pregnancy and physical activity. The learning objectives today are basically to take an overview of pregnancy and the developmental origins of health and disease, affectionately called DOHAD, and the importance of the fetal environment. I'm also going to talk about the importance of physical activity during pregnancy and introduce you to the 2019 Canadian Guideline for Physical Activity Throughout Pregnancy, and also talk a bit about how to be active throughout the day. And I want to end with two new document tools that are available from the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology website called Get Active for Pregnancy and the Healthcare Provider Consultation Form. So the fetal environment is important because the egg that formed you was created when your grandmother was pregnant with your mom. So that sounds interesting when you think about it, but really the mother or the first generation here is actually your grandmother who is pregnant with this fetus here, which is the second generation and your mom, while the developing egg or ova in that fetus is actually you. So the interesting thing about this is that the fetal environment can influence two, even three generations. And this is called epigenetics or fetal programming and brings me to the point of the developmental origins of health and disease. Another name for this is called the Barker hypothesis. And this hypothesis talks about the adverse influences early in development especially in utero, and results in permanent ch changes in physiology and metabolism, resulting in increased risk of disease in adulthood. And so this can be bad events, such as those events that lead to chronic disease risk, for example, gestational diabetes, myelitis, or hypertension during pregnancy, or it could be good events, which could set the stage for a healthy lifestyle. There are several risk factors and common links to chronic disease. And to me, I think the main one here in the middle is physical inactivity. And physical inactivity has been linked to excessive gestational weight gain. It has been linked to obesity, and it has been linked to gestational diabetes myelitis. And the whole aspect of physical inactivity can lead to type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and metabolic syndrome later in life for both the mother and the baby. The Institute of Medicine suggested weight gain guidelines during pregnancy, and anything beyond these guidelines is considered excessive pregnancy weight gain. And these guidelines are based on pre-pregnancy body mass index, which is listed here, and their BMI categories are listed uh, in the second to the left column here. What this suggests is total weight gain 
in pounds and I've got in square brackets here what the kilograms would be for those of you that are into kilograms. And what you'll notice here, for example, is a normal weight individual should not gain beyond 35 pounds or 16 kilograms. And the 25 to 35 total weight range is for a normal weight individual. And also the Institute of Medicine would suggest that the rates of weight gain for the second and third trimester for a normal weight individual should not go beyond one pound per week or 0.45 kilograms per week. You'll also notice that as the BMI category increases, the amount of weight that can be gained decreases. So for example, an individual that is considered obese should not gain beyond 20 pounds or nine kilograms. And these guideline figures here also assumes that weight in the first trimester should not go above four pounds or two kilograms. So again, these are guidelines for the healthcare provider for the amount of weight that should be gained during pregnancy. And anything beyond that would be considered excessive pregnancy weight gain. So that actually is a modifiable risk factor. If we infuse physical activity into our figure here, then we can modify and have adequate gestational weight gain. And with adequate gestational weight gain, we may be able to prevent obesity, gestational diabetes, and also prevent chronic disease risk later in life for both the mother and the downstream effects on the future child. We received a grant from the Canadian Institute of Health Research to put together a consensus panel of experts in the area of exercise and pregnancy, methodologists, and several stakeholders to review the literature and come up with guidelines for pregnancy and exercise. And we spent three and a half years worth of work. And when we looked at the literature, we searched up to January 6, 2017. We screened almost 30,000 titles and abstracts, and we came up with 675 unique studies. And based on this, we published 12 systematic reviews that were published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And as a result of these 12 systematic reviews, I want to present this data to you here. Physical activity has been found to reduce the risk of gestational diabetes by 38%, gestational hypertension by 39%, preeclampsia by 41%, excessive gestational weight gain by 32%, depression by 67%, urinary incontinence during pregnancy by 51% and during the postpartum period by 47%, macrosomia or big babies by 39% and instrumental delivery by 24%. We also found that physical activity was not associated with miscarriage, stillbirth, neonatal death, birth defects, preterm labor, premature rupture of membranes, low birth weight, induction of labor, neonatal hypoglycemia or other birth complications. And we also found that it was not associated with changes in fetal heart rate or uteroplacental blood flow metrics. And so what this meant was that the evidence-based document that was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine and titled the 2019 Canadian Guideline for Physical Activity Throughout Pregnancy is based on evidence. And I want to share with you excerpts from this document that was published in 2018. And the first thing I want to talk to you about is who should be physically active during pregnancy. And these guidelines are intended for women who do not have contraindications to being physically active. And listed here on the left are absolute contraindications. And those individuals with absolute contraindications may continue usual activities of daily living, but should not participate in more strenuous activity. And on the right here, those with relative contraindications should discuss the advantages and disadvantages of moderate, moderate to vigorous physical activity with their obstetric care provider. There are six recommendations within this document and these are available at the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology website. And the first one here is 
that all women without contraindication should be physically active throughout pregnancy. We also looked at specific subgroups, women who were previously inactive, those diagnosed with gestational diabetes, those categorized as overweight or obese with a pre-pregnancy body mass index of over 25. And we found that physical activity during the first trimester did not increase the odds of miscarriage or congenital anomalies. And we found that not engaging in physical activity from first trimester actually increased the odds of pregnancy complications. And so therefore, this first guideline here suggests that physical activity be encouraged throughout pregnancy. I've got recommendation two and three here together because I think they are related. So number two suggests that pregnant women should accumulate at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity each week to achieve a clinically meaningful health benefit and reduction in pregnancy complications. And number three suggests that physical activity should be accumulated over a minimum of three days per week. However, every, being active every day is encouraged. So basically, every minute counts. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So what we found was that even lower intensity physical activity also has benefits. And therefore, we encourage all women to be physically active, even if they can't meet these recommendations. We also found that the highest level of physical activity was about seven metabolic equivalents or METs, and that's about uh, equal to jogging. But we found that the safety of chronic high intensity physical activity was not known. High intensity physical activity is recommended only in a monitored environment, but moderate intensity physical activity is what is recommended throughout pregnancy. What is moderate intensity physical activity? It is activity intense enough to increase heart rate so that a person can talk but not sing. It's very difficult to exercise and sing at the same time. And those examples are brisk walking, water aerobics, stationary cycling, resistance training, household chores such as gardening, and even washing windows. And the best ways to monitor intensity is also in our document. There are maternal heart rate ranges, and I'll talk about them in a moment. But there's also something called the talk test, which is where an individual main, can maintain a conversation during physical activity, so you know that that intensity is fine. If they are not able to carry on a conversation, then the intensity should be reduced. Also in this document, as I've mentioned, are the target heart rate ranges for pregnant women. You'll notice here maternal age less than 29 years and those individuals that are 30 and older. You'll notice intensity here, so light, moderate, and vigorous intensity for both age groups. And these are the target heart rate ranges. So for example, a woman who is 29 years of age that has been exercising would have a target heart rate range of 125 to 146 beats per minute. If she's never exercised before, she can start with the target heart rate range of 102 to 124. Now there's a little asterisk here or this little C means that any individual that goes beyond that higher range should have uh, medical advice. And moderate intensity physical activity here is equivalent to about 40 to 59% of heart rate reserve and vigorous is about 60 to 80% of heart rate reserve. Recommendation number four is that pregnant women should incorporate a variety of aerobic and resistance training activities to achieve greater benefits. Even adding yoga or gentle stretching may also be beneficial. Recommendation number five is pelvic floor muscle training. For example, Kegel exercises may be performed on a daily basis to reduce those risks of urinary incontinence. However, proper instruction is important. And as I mentioned previously, pelvic floor muscle training is associated with a 50% reduction in prenatal and a 35% reduction in postnatal urinary incontinence. But proper technique is extremely important, and we suggest going to a pelvic floor physiotherapist. The last recommendation here is based on weak evidence regarding supine exercise. 
So the recommendation here is that pregnant women who experience lightheadedness, nausea, or feel unwell when they exercise flat on their back should modify their exercise position to avoid the supine. And I've got some diagrams here that I'd like to share with you. So this shows you a pregnant individual standing with the pregnant uterus with no impingement on the inferior vena cava. But then when she lies flat on her back and engages in supine exercise, the pregnant uterus may in fact impinge on the inferior vena cava and cause dizziness. Or the other thing that we're not clear on is it could also impinge on the abdominal aorta, which is the major blood supply to the fetus and the placenta. And so in the supine position, blood flow potentially may be restricted. So we err on the side of caution. There are other considerations in this document for implementation. For example, safety precautions. So avoid activities that involve physical contact or danger of falling or fetal trauma. And avoid but not limited to, for example, horseback riding, downhill skiing, ice hockey, gymnastics, Olympic lifting. And these are common sense. Avoid non-stationary cycling as this may carry a higher risk of falling due to changes in body mechanics. Alternatives are activities with less risk of falling or physical contact. Another precaution is to avoid vigorous physical activity and excessive heat, especially high humidity, for example, hot yoga. And of course, warming up and cooling down before and after the activity is important. And it's also important to be very cautious of flexibility and range of motion because the ligaments may become more relaxed during pregnancy. Resistance training, the individual must adhere to the safety considerations. And mixed interventions combining aerobic and resistance training activities have better improvements in pregnancy outcome than just straight aerobic activity alone. And of course, it's very important during resistance training to avoid holding one's breath or the Valsalva maneuver, especially if the individual experiences lightheadedness. Other precautions are athletic competition is recommended to be avoided, so no athletic competition. However, if the individual feels that they must compete, then they need to do that with, with their obstetric care provider. And elite athletes who continue to train are advised to seek a gain supervision by an obstetric care provider with knowledge of the impact of this vigorous intensity physical activity. And the International Olympic Committee released a five-part series of recommendations to guide the elite athlete. And that was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And I was lucky enough to be involved in this 2016 International Olympic Committee expert group that met in Lausanne, Switzerland. And basically the bottom line of this was that there's a significant lack of high quality evidence specific to the pregnant elite athlete and especially the impact of high intensity exercise and extreme doses of exercise during pregnancy on maternal and newborn outcomes. And so again, with the high intensity, there is that precaution. There are other safety precautions for prenatal physical activity. Some of them we have talked about already. Avoid physical activity in excessive heat, especially with high humidity. Avoid activities that involve physical contact or danger of falling. Avoid scuba diving because the fetus is not protected from decompression sickness and gas embolism. Lowlander women, so those living below 2,500 meters, should avoid physical activity at higher altitudes above that. And those considering physical activity above those altitudes should seek supervision by an obstetric care provider with knowledge of the impact of high altitude on maternal and fetal outcomes. And again, those considering athletic competition should seek obstetric advice and maintaining adequate nutrition and hydration. So drinking water before, during and after physical activity is extremely important. And also knowing the reasons to stop physical activity and consult a qualified healthcare provider immediately if they occur. And these are those reasons. So for example, persistent excessive shortness of breath, severe chest pain, regular and painful uterine contractions, vaginal bleeding, persistent loss of fluid from the vagina that indicates perhaps rupture of membranes or persistent dizziness or faintness. So all women that have this should stop activity and seek medical attention immediately. 
So how do we start being physically active during pregnancy? As I've mentioned previously, inactive women can start gradually at a lower intensity and they can increase the duration and intensity as pregnancy progresses. More physical activity, so frequency, intensity, time, and volume, we found had greater health benefits. However, remember that that upper limit was not established. Physical activity does not need to be in a supervised setting or with specific equipment. Activities as simple as walking can have positive health benefits for both mom and baby. And again, coming back to that guideline that suggests 150 minutes per week, and that can be about 30 minutes per day for five days a week. And the other question here is what happens during the day and the other 23 and a half hours? There's a great YouTube video by Dr. Mike Evans from uh, British Columbia that says, how do we make our day harder? Let's make our day harder. So I suggest you take a look at that because I think it's really important in order for us to increase our activity level throughout the day. So based on this video, there are several ways to be physically active that Dr. Evans suggests. For example, increase the step counts per day by parking farther away, taking the stairs, using pedometers or your cell phone to count your steps. Pregnant women can rake their leaves, cut the grass, gardening, shoveling snow. Yes, they have to be careful of their back, but yes, they can. And many of their partners are saying, yes, this is exciting that they are able to do all of these wonderful activities. And of course, they can play with their kids. And if they check out their cupboard, you can see my diagram at the bottom here, a photograph of a pregnant individual that's using those big, huge cans of tomatoes from their cupboards. And they can use those cans of tomatoes for muscle conditioning activity while they're reading a book or while they're watching TV. Again, every minute counts. There are several resources or these two new resources that I want to share with you for the healthcare provider, the exercise professional, and the pregnant individual. And the Canadian Society of Exercise Physiology, their website, provides that 2019 Canadian guideline for physical activity throughout pregnancy. And I'd like to share with you these two tools, the Get Active Questionnaire for Pregnancy and the Healthcare Provider Consultation Form. So this is the Get Active Questionnaire for Pregnancy. It was just released by the CSEP on April the 15th, 2021. It is designed to be a self-administered pre-screening tool to empower individuals to be responsible for their own health and well-being during their pregnancy. And it replaces the Parmedex for pregnancy uh, that has been used for the last 20 years. And this document now assists in removing barriers to being physically active because pregnant individuals no longer need medical approval to be physically active. And if they do have any of the contraindications and they do need healthcare provider approval, there is this healthcare provider companion form. And it also is two pages that is for the healthcare provider in conjunction with the fitness professional and the pregnant individual to increase the communication between those three dynamics. So to summarize, the document that I've suggested, the new 2019 Canadian document for physical activity throughout pregnancy represents a foundational shift in our view of physical activity. We're now going from recommended behavior to improved quality of life to specific prescription for physical activity to reduce pregnancy complications and optimize health for two and three generations. And it's important to implement these guidelines into clinical practice for lifelong benefits for mother and child. So I wanna end off here. My job is to grow healthy babies. So I firmly believe that healthy mothers equals healthy babies equals healthy futures. And these are the, my two babies here in the front row, in the left here, those are my two babies. So I firmly believe in growing healthy babies. So let's make a difference for two and three generations in the future. And during the question period, I would be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Michelle. Up next is Sarah Leva. She is an assistant professor in the School of Nursing at Trinity Western University. 
Sarah has a clinical background in labor and delivery and family practice and teaches in the areas of maternity evidence-based practice, qualitative inquiry, and knowledge synthesis and translation. Sarah lives in British Columbia with her young family. Thank you, Dr. Matilla, for that presentation. I should say, as I lead into this, some of the things I'm going to be talking about are things that Dr. Matilla has been talking about for 20 years and um, utmost respect for your work. I'm going to talk a little bit in this presentation around the diversity in trajectories around postpartum physical activity engagement. And just kind of to deconstruct and unpack different ways that people are making decisions about activity following childbirth. My name is Sarah, as Erin indicated, and I'm from Trinity Western University in Langley, um, which is located on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Stolo people. I'm going to focus a little less on the guidelines and the recommendations for integrating postpartum activity and more so from the people's perspective of making decisions following birth. So I'll talk a little bit about people's needs during the postpartum decision-making um, and how we might think about reaching people following birth. I'm gonna go a little bit more on breadth um, rather than depth, just to kind of give a sense of the whole. So the postpartum period, this is the year following childbirth. And key to this is regardless of what people are doing around their activity, is they're also at a phase, they're transitionally, you know, redefining their relationships to themselves, their physical body, their emotional selves, their relationship, and also their external environment. Because having an infant changes the way that you're engaging with the environment and things that are accessible, timing, scheduling, and whatnot. And people within this are revisiting their relationship to physical activity on an ongoing basis. So they're trying to work out personal, my capacity, personally and relationally to actually engage in activities and how feasible they are now in this time period. And just to kind of carry through what uh, Dr. Matola was saying, that pregnancy experiences um, so people might have had traumatic birth experiences or high-risk pregnancies. These are going to shape um, people's perceptions on what they're going to be engaging in postpartum. And particularly for, um, so I did a study with moms and talking to them about their experiences and found that people who had really early negative experiences with engaging with activity, regardless of their history or background, this really impacted where they landed and it really set the bar for what they were willing to engage in. So it's really critical that um, there is that contact and supporting safety in engaging in activity following birth. In terms of the needs, I think they can kind of be captured in these sort of three ideas, safety, and so a sensitivity to the breadth of the concerns and the, the key physical activity considerations um, so that we can support safe uh, return to activity or safe engagement activity following birth. And parents really need information. So I kind of call this information brokering. People will receive activity information perhaps from their care provider, but that might not be continued on or carried through. And particularly now, if there's more of the online visit, some of the health promotion pieces are kind of getting less attention in some of these visits. And so people don't have as much information about how to engage in activity and where to get information from. Um, and so that's a really key piece. And then also support. Another thing to think is that the activity decisions people are making are ongoing and they're continuing. So they might try something and then find that was way too much and they're continuing and adjusting on and on in that post year. I'm gonna highlight that there's differences in how people take up activity, um, but they're all sort of connected to these three ideas or four ideas of self relationships, environment and activity. So regardless of where people are landing, they're, they're thinking through these particular aspects. On consensus, on average, this is kind of general postpartum activity patterns. Following childbirth, there is lower rates of moderate vigorous physical activity as compared to people of similar age. And there is also increased, there's some evidence going around saying that there's increased light and decreased sedentary activity, which makes sense because people are taking care of an infant. And so they're rocking their baby, they're walking, they're doing those types of things. So that's going to affect their actual engagement and activity. Um, and in the study that I did, I found that 
for the most part, people, once they sort of landed on where they were kind of engaging or the degree of engagement, they stayed there. And then if they encountered difficulties, if anything, they went downwards in terms of their um, pursuit of activity. And so there's a generalized downward trajectory or a stable trajectory, but not an increase. So that's the general, but there's also diversity within the actual patterns themselves. The diversity comes in the ways that they looked at those key three ideas, four ideas, so personal, self, relational, and environment. So people are asking themselves following Bird, am I ready for activity? What activities, what's safe? And a key thing that I found a little surprising was how much emphasis people put on safety from an emotional standpoint. So it wasn't just the physical engagement, but is it that for us doing something at a recreation center or an outdoor class, is that going to affect my emotional stability or my functional ability to engage and take care of my infant and perform my daily activities? So that was a significant weight. And there was a lot of concern about judgment. And this is from people who even have, you know, extensive activity histories. And there is concern about being in a group and being not as fit as they were and working that process out and being around friends and not being in the same fitness place. And also from some parents who'd had negative experiences with other parents in other settings, not, not physical activity settings, where they were judged by other parents. And so they didn't really want to be around other parents. So they didn't want to be engaging in those types of classes or environment. And then there was also a lot of consideration around injury and pain a significant percent of people have some degree of injury as they're recovering physically from birth, pain or discomfort. In the group that I talked to, over two thirds of them had something that they were dealing with across the postpartum year. There was also consideration of functional impairment in relation to injury. So for people who had a chronic condition or exacerbation of an injury, such as a back injury, they would consider whether or not I can actually engage in this is, or is this going to exacerbate my injury? And again, come back to affecting my ability to take care of my baby. So these personal de decision factors are key um, in considering people's thoughts on how accessible activity is to them, um, what types of activities they're gonna do and in what environment. Relationally, people considering if pursuing their activities are going to negatively affect their relationships or their infant. So they're considering whether, for example, if I go to an evening class or an evening activity, is that gonna compromise my time with my partner or is it gonna be complicated because of my infant feeding pattern? Is it gonna work if I'm actually doing this activity or is it gonna negatively affect my infant? Or is it also going to negatively affect my reliance on other people if I'm using them for childcare? One thing that kind of stood out was that people are asking, is activity the right place to be pooling scarce childcare resources? So even if there's something they really wanted to do, childcare um, was scarce. And so um, unless it was really important to them, they wouldn't necessarily pursue that in the context of activity. And so this is an example of somebody who loved music and she would prioritize that. Um, but activity just, it wasn't going to work because there just wasn't opportunity to do a range of things that they were desiring. Um, and these were important in people's considerations of where they were going to be active and when they were going to be active. People were also considering the walkability, safe stroller access. A few people talked about having not a safe place to be active and they wanted roadways that weren't bumpy because especially with jogging, they didn't want to move their infant's head around if they were pushing a stroller. So that was particularly important. And then location, rural versus urban is their walkable streets and decisions around indoor. And I think I would extend this actually to um, online environments and outdoor class environments. These are affected by cost. Even people who had money and were not concerned with that were still considering cost as a significant thought process in what they were doing. Program and payment flexibility and family level accommodations. So quite a few people had other siblings, like the infant had other siblings, and it was difficult for them to access um, the programs that they wanted to because the older siblings couldn't come or there wasn't, they had to do childcare for that sibling even if they had an infant in the class with them. So those were important considerations. 
and as well as the ease and visibility of program and childcare information. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then the childcare structure, if there is one. Now, I don't have any really good data on how much people are engaging in childcare within facilities. And I know there's been so many changes with what's accessible. So um, kind of speaking to the past on that, but it, it is important in considering childcare, um, like the number of time slots, how hard it is to access them, um, how on top of things you need to be to be able to actually get your child signed up, um, the cleanliness of the childcare facility itself. So these were all really important factors. And so in taking those three things together, what I found was that there were sort of three trajectories that people sort of landed. So they put these points together, like they looked at these personal, decisional, relational, environmental, and they kind of landed in different places. So there was one group of people, and I would say the distribution of this, this the second one here, there was more people in this group, um, but of 30 people, there was at least eight people on the first group and the third group. So the middle group was a little bit more populated, but there was definitely people on either side as well. So this first group kind of looked at everything and they might have had less um, involvement with activity in their life. And they decided looking at the challenges with planning and organizing to have anything, even going for a hike or any of that, that that was going to be just, it just wasn't worth it. There was going to be high personal risk. It was going to be emotionally stressful. Um, it was going to be relationally stressful. It was going to be too hard to organize with around feeding and to just organize in general. And that there were other preferable activities. So these people might wanted to engage in other things and put their energy and efforts towards that because activity to them wasn't sort of central to like their identity and they could live without it beyond these activities intrinsic to parenthood. So one of the things that was interesting was that regardless of whatever anyone's background was, everybody was doing activity to some degree and everybody was walking um, because that was, and so of course I live in BC, so I don't know if that changes things in terms of outdoor um, availability and, um, and that it was weather, but everybody was walking because it helped put their baby to sleep. It helped, they had to go to different places. And so it just, it was intrinsic to just living and parenting in that first year. Um, and then, but these groups, they sort of kept it within that sphere of walking and then the things that are part of parenthood. So taking a baby in and out of stroller, rocking, um, taking a baby in and out of a car seat. So they were active in those ways and they sort of saw it being active as kind of a, a wait and I'll get there someday. But for now, I'm just gonna leave it. However, they all wanted to do something. So even if they didn't have a strong background with activity, there was always something that they were looking forward to participating in at some point. And then the second group here, these people were involved in a range of recreational outdoor engagement, but limited in their sport and independent activity. So independent being activity by themselves without their baby. So when they looked at those key ideas, there were varying sort of degrees of risk that they associated with it. These people all sort of landed in saying, you know, I'm not gonna really have somebody else take care of my child for exercise. I'm gonna just do that with my baby. And then there was various concerns about um, the risk of injury. Um, and there was a range of limits that people would place. So some of these people were very happy to um, go into a group setting and be with other parents and really enjoy that. Whereas some of the people in this group thought that that was too high risk and they had concerns about being judged in those environments and more might be apt to go outside and do hiking or something like that. And then this last group here, um, they had a range of physical activity and um, they had an intentional return to independent activity on their own and sport. So these were the people that actually went back to their sports teams and were engaged in that because when they looked at those factors, they thought that they were, it was just, completely um, positive in terms of this is worth pursuing because I'm going to have, maybe I'm going to be a better parent. I'm going to be able to support my family better. I'm going to feel competent, more confident. I'm going to be able to take care of my infant better. Um, and even though I might have some concerns about um, my physical capacity in that, I'm going to gradually work with that and pursue it. And so I just said that the diversity is linked with these different trajectories. So these different desires that people really, or how important they thought it was for them in their lives was linked with these different trajectories. So for the people in this last group, it was just absolutely essential in their view to have this in activity in their life 
to a degree beyond motherhood activities. And so just a quick stop and just commenting on how people are feeling in the early postpartum. So this would be in the first couple months even. Um, there was a lot of anxiety for people even who had histories of engaging a lot of activity. They weren't sure where to land or where to how to engage. And so they might base their degree of engagement with activity on their previous level of fitness. And sometimes this actually led to difficult situations. And one mom talked about how she left her house and um, found herself like a mile away and then couldn't get back because she didn't realize that it was going to be that hard on her body. And so she misjudged the situation. And that is partly because of the lack of information. Um, and then the flip side, some people were quite, um, they were quite underwhelmed. They, they thought, oh geez, I really could have started walking earlier. And I was really holding back because I didn't know um, because of X, Y, Z, I had stitches and this, that, and the other, and they held back and they could have been getting the benefits of the activity earlier. Um, but at the same time, a lot of people had anticipation. They had this hold that they were going to get to it eventually. And then during the postpartum, as it was an ongoing process, so some people would feel successful as they're trying to go back to the activities that they wanted to. And there was also frustration and disappointment and compromise. So a lot of people sort of in that sort of set second trajectory, kind of variably engaging, not necessarily going back to what they wanted. These people did want to do activity on their own at some point, but for the most part, they held back and just did exercise with their babies because of those other factors, their degree of risk that they perceived and the ability for them to access it, the feasibility. They were compromising and they were just holding out for the future that this would change, but they weren't entirely satisfied with what they were doing, doing um, an infant mother swimming class, for example, they wanted to be doing things on their own and getting back to the things that they liked. And then there was some disappointment about this process of coming back. And for some people who had those negative experiences, there was incredible frustration. They felt like they were losing a part of themselves because for whatever reason, scheduling and that it was difficult for them to be active. And um, just to note too, that for the most part, the going to fitness center or doing a class or even just outdoor activity, like going for a hike, going for a walk with another person, meeting somebody there, that for some people had varying degrees of how complicated that was to plan for. And so they were more apt to be able to kind of take that on by about four to five months. Everybody was who wasn't sort of satisfied, they were kind of holding themselves okay with this because they thought they would get there someday. So taking that all together and just the challenges of targeting barriers to activity is that because there's diversity in how people are looking at activity, the barriers aren't universal. So kind of a one-stop shop is not going to be easiest to kind of improve access. So there might be need to be different strategies that are used because the steps to achieving different forms of activity uh, might be viewed differently because people had different views on those, the self, the relationships and the environment. So for example, one of the, you know, a lot of the barriers that have been identified around lack of fatigue, lack of time, fatigue and childcare for the people that were pursuing that independent activity, going back to activity on their own, doing running, doing classes, rather than looking at that as a barrier, they saw these as issues to overcome and problem solve um, rather than a barrier. It wasn't something that was going to stop their engagement in activity. They were gonna work through it. And they had a pool of resources socially and also from their history of maybe engaging in leisure in the community and being aware of what was available and that helped them in that process. And um, breaking the barrier of reaching new parents. So if we go back to these trajectories here, these people that are engaging in a range of recreational and the independent return to activity, so getting back to what they wanted to do, they were more apt to you know, be able to access rec center information, leisure center information, whereas the people in this first group didn't necessarily have that information or that contact, or they didn't, um, they didn't receive um, information around what services were available or didn't know where the best places were to access this. So they might not be getting, just because there is a really strong platform or website and that they might not actually be using that or accessing that. And so just to close out here, taking to improving access 
is that key sort of goals being around supporting informational access, equity, and inclusivity, and the availability of resources and support not necessarily are equal. So for these people who had that history of activity, they had a, either a social network, and these were actual social people that they saw in their day-to-day -day lives that they could use to resource and problem solve and ask and how how do you get activity and or they could use each other. One person would go for a run while one person watched their child and then switch. So they had a lot of that and they found it really easy to navigate the programming information um, and find out where different trails were and that sort of thing. They found that that was easy based on sort of those resources that they had. Um, but for other people, they found looking at um, the resource guides or the recreation center guides to be um, very difficult to engage. And so there wasn't that equalness in um, their accessibility to information. In terms of supporting inclusivity, consideration and just in terms of programming and the visual materials that are presented, um, is there diversity in your images that are being communicated at your center? Is the language being used gender neutral and people first? So rather than perhaps thinking about different language. So rather than saying mother, which I've done a couple of times, but rather than saying mother, you might choose to say parent. And so that people are, it's more inclusive in terms of language and um, reaching people. And another piece could be around working with the public health care to improve the messaging. So I think that back to that information brokering piece, is there ways that your facility, is there ways that your community sport can engage with the public health care providers in giving them information that can be passed forward to people? Uh, people usually receive uh, packages of information from their health care provider. Is there a way that recreational center programming trails and that can be integrated as a part to sort of improve those communication channels and the likelihood that everybody's going to get that information? And then just to echo Michelle's conversation about that every minute counts. So that message in programming advertising around any activity as being valuable. In continuing to support activity engagement, having diverse options across environments and participants, flexible delivery, timing of day, online, outdoor, diverse program options, non-parenting program, free or low cost, um, and then a key thing to have online or outdoor options to be analogous in accessibility across cost, time of day, and people's access to that. And this next piece here is this by Seeger and all. This is a really good resource, I, I think. And in this article, her and her authors talk about cultivating interest through delivering messages about uh, daily life and people's daily concerns. So targeting the things that are actually relevant to what people are thinking about, like wanting to engage in physical activity following childbirth. Do you have concerns about coming back? These are the types of advertising that might pull in more connection to what it is that they're doing in daily life. And then of course, outdoor roadway and bike path considerations. And then in turn of sustaining engagement, continuing on with that linking physical activity with success in daily life and self-selected activities. Um, rather having people um, opportunities to choose various things that they're wanting to engage in and continuing on that, the everything counts messaging to support autonomy relatedness and competence. Because a lot of the people who were used to having more activity felt like they were disappointed they weren't doing what they were doing before. And so um, that messaging is really important. And also other people knew that there were guidelines around just generally like what was what would be um, the recommendations. And so they kind of felt like I'm never gonna get there. And so just really reinforcing that messaging that everything counts. Um, and then injury prevention in physical activity and sport, and particularly in sport, the people who went back to their sports teams in this, there was a few of them, they all got injured. And that impacted to some extent their further engagement. And then time tailoring, considering programs that start at different times or that are targeting different periods of the postpartum. So like that four to five month window when people are more apt to be engaging in um, outdoor activities and or accessing recreation center facilities. And then beyond infancy and family friendly options. So some people in that first year were holding out for being able to access those things as they kind of um, we're adjusting to that period and 
working out those relationships. And so there might be things after. So it's extending this idea when thinking about parenting options that some of those more challenging organizationally things to reach would be more within reach after that year. So thank you for inviting me here and um, to Aaron and to Krista and everyone. Uh, appreciate that and some resources and references as well. Thank you, Sarah. Emily Rand is our next speaker and she is the manager of special projects for the Sport for Life Society. Emily holds a Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Physical and Health Education from Queen's University and a Master's of Science in Kinesiology from the University of Victoria. Emily is passionate about movement and helping program leaders create inclusive, welcoming environments for people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds so that they can enjoy a variety of activities across their lifespan. She is a multi-sport athlete who loves traveling, camping, and exploring the great outdoors with family and friends. Emily is a new mom to a one-year-old daughter. Thank you, Erin, for that introduction and to CPRA for having me on this webinar today. I'm really honored to be joining in this conversation because it is something that is so near and dear to my heart um, as I have just had my first child. So I am here today to um, talk about my personal journey into motherhood and really the shifting identity and activities that I've experienced. Um, from pregnancy to postpartum and how that has affected my involvement in sport, physical activity and recreation. And having had the opportunity to really reflect on my experience so far through the development of this presentation has made me so acutely aware of the shift um, in identity of who I was before becoming a mom and who I am now. And I think that journey, my journey into motherhood, that term is really fitting uh, because the basic definition of the word is traveling from one place to another. Uh, and that's what I have, uh, that's exactly what I have experienced. And I must also preface this presentation by saying that this is my unique journey um, and that while no two people uh, share the same story of pregnancy, labor and delivery, early postpartum, and then the lifelong role of being a mom or parent, there are many similar challenges, changes, and wonderful moments that we all share. So my intention today is to share some of those with you um, in hopes that you are able to create um, or adjust any programs that you may currently be running or wanting to offer pre and postnatal women within sport, physical activity, and recreation settings. Uh, before I go any further, I want to respectfully acknowledge that I am uh, joining you today from Collingwood, Ontario, which is where I currently live with my daughter and my husband, and it's located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat peoples. And I'm so honored to be a guest um, living on these beautiful territories with my family. So when I talk about shifting identity, I have to start by uh, saying, who was I before um, becoming pregnant and becoming a mom? So I spent my childhood in the country uh, where I grew up and spent a lot of time being active outside through a lot of free play, risky play, just so much great outdoor access. And then throughout school, I would say I was a multi-sport athlete every season, um, playing a different sport in school, uh, both in public school and in high school, never at a highly competitive level outside of school, but certainly had an interest in many different sports. Um, and then as I got older, I was a camp instructor um, at uh, a sport camp. Uh, so, you know, kind of shifted from that participant to coach role, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and all of that upbringing really uh, led me to want to study physical and health education at university. Upon um, finishing my degree in physical and health education, I had a great opportunity to become a pre and postnatal fitness specialist at um, a small uh, fitness studio that was close to the university. And that was the first time that it really opened my eyes to what a unique part in it, um, or time in a woman's life uh, it is when you're pregnant or postnatal and just how many changes happen then and uh, such an important time to really think about the health of uh, not only oneself, but of the baby as well. 
After working there for about a year, I also became very interested in completing my doula training. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with the role of a doula, that's a non-medical support, really emotional and comfort person who is there assisting a woman um, throughout labor and delivery. Again, not providing medical support, but uh, really helping to uh, provide the other supports that are crucial and such a, a big part um, in that journey. And while I'm not a practicing doula now, I did have the opportunity to um, attend a few of my good friends' uh, deliveries of their first children, and that was just so special. And um, yeah, again, just continue to open my eyes to this really important part in uh, one's life. Over the past uh, number of years, I've been working within the health and sports sector. And as Aaron introduced, I have been working at a national multi-sport organization called Support for Life which is a really great opportunity to work with a number of sport, recreation, uh, health, uh, education professionals and helping them to create inclusive and welcoming programs that they're offering. And so given all this and then my general interest in, you know, always wanting to have a family growing up, that was something that I, I wanted to do and a, a love for children and babies. You know, I thought I would be very prepared for pregnancy and having a baby um, with all of my kind of experience and um, knowledge in the, you know, in those realms. And then in August of 2019, I found out that uh, I was pregnant with our first child and it was a super exciting time and also became a very scary time for me because, you know, I had been talking about guidelines and had been a pre postnatal fitness specialist working with, with, um, pre postnatal moms thinking that I knew exactly, you know, okay, what activities can I do? What's, you know, what can support a healthy pregnancy. And then I got into my own personal situation and things changed. I, you know, I started to question, is this okay for me? How is this going to affect the baby? So many different things that it was no longer black and white. Um, and so what that pregnancy journey looked like for me um, in the first trimester, uh, as many, many people do experience, um, very fatigued, my energy levels were very low, and I had come into pregnancy with a very good baseline, I would say, in terms of being active, meeting general physical activity guidelines, uh, but that, yeah, it definitely changed in that first trimester. And I really had to just adjust to this new feeling and something that was really out of my control um, in terms of, you know, wanting to be active because that was part of my personal identity, um, but really just could, could not muster up the energy to uh, be active for a lot of it. And then, you know, some other physical changes, you, I'm sure many of you have heard about those food cravings and aversions. I definitely experienced that again, coming in as a fairly healthy person, eating a variety of fruits and vegetables and, you know, following uh, Canada's food guidelines. I don't think I really ate many vegetables throughout the pregnancy at all. I just had a huge aversion to it, which surprised me. And one of the only ways I consumed vegetables was in Caesar salads, because that was the one thing that I always wanted. Um, but again, it just changed and I, I wasn't expecting that, but I had to go with it because, um, it's, it's just so wild how, um, pregnancy with all the changes going on. Um, yeah, it can make you really crave and, uh, feel aversions to things. And then of course my body was changing. Um, so, and again, in that first trimester feeling, um, for lack of a better word, blah, bloated, heavy. Um, in the second trimester, I did get that second wind, which uh, many people experience that that was great for my energy levels and my um, ability to be able to be active. And then going into the third trimester, um, really based on mobility changes and um, energy levels, was able to stay fairly um, active, but not to the same degree that I was pre-pregnancy. There's also a lot of mental and emotional changes throughout pregnancy. Um, just, you know, thinking about how life is about to change and then all of the emotional hormonal changes that are happening. And that definitely affected how I was engaging in sport, physical activity and recreation as well. 
the types of activities I was doing. So in the beginning, um, coming in pre-pregnancy, oh, I was doing a lot of strength and conditioning training. Um, and then that really shifted as I became pregnant and um, yeah, just what I was interested in, what I felt my body and what my mind could support that changed. And I, uh, especially later on in pregnancy, started doing more like lighter um body friendly activities such as swimming and yoga and a lot of walking so lots of changes throughout those nine ish months um and so my daughter was born in may of 2020 and as i'm sure many of you can recall uh the global pandemic started two months before that so my last trimester was extremely stressful and um, i'm going to go into that next so making a birth plan in an unprecedented time. So as I said, uh, the, the global pandemic started in about March of 2020. So I was just a couple of months shy of my due date. At the time, my husband and I were living in Victoria, BC, and um, both of our parents and all of our family were in Ontario. And as the world started to shut down, um, our parents were planning on coming out for the birth, um, but their flights got canceled. The restrictions were starting to come down. And so my general feeling at this time, I can't help but think of that emoji, right, where it's the upside down face. Um, trying to smile because I wanted to stay positive uh, going into this new chapter of life. But really, my whole world um, and our family's whole world was being flipped upside down and trying to make a birth plan, all expectations going out the window in terms of what supports would be available if our families weren't able to come out to see us and friends at that time, people weren't allowed into each other's houses. What kind of um, support would we be able to have postpartum, even, you know, access to um, lactation consultants and in-home nurses, all of that seemed to be kind of shutting down. So it was really scary. And um, yeah, when you go into uh, labor and delivery, I think it's you know extremely helpful to be in a positive mindset, but it was really hard to get to there um, because there's just so much changing in the world at that time. And we had a tough decision to make, you know, with uh, with everything considered, we really had to think about, are, okay, are we just going to be trying to do this, the two of us supporting a newborn, totally uncharted territory on our own, or are we going to try to be close to our families? And ultimately, what we decided to do at, when I was 37 weeks pregnant, just, sh just shy of that 40-week uh, um, Mark, we drove across the country, my husband and I and our dog, we drove from Victoria to um, Ontario to, uh, yeah, have our child in Ontario and plan to be there for a month so that we could be surrounded by our immediate family because otherwise it wasn't looking like we didn't know when we would be able to see them or what kind of support we would have. So I had to let go of a lot of expectations. And in those last couple of months, with so many competing priorities and stresses, act Activity was definitely not a priority for me. And I knew how important it was. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Motola had talked about that in terms of the, the guidelines and, you know, every little bit helped, but with just so much changing, could only mentally, emotionally, physically focus on so much. And then I had a really long labor and delivery, and I won't go into all of the details, but I had what is called prodromal labor. So my contractions actually started um, three to four days before I went into active labor. And of course, I was exhausted coming up to this point, right, with all of the stresses of the pandemic, of our five-day drive across the country, of being in a new place, hormones continuing to change. Um, and then I went into, yeah, a four day, uh, four day on and off waxing and waning contractions before actually going into active labor. And that made for then an extremely long, when I did go into active labor, a long period, um, that was very mentally and physically challenging. Um, and at the end of it, we did, um, have to have more, uh, medical interventions that then we were anticipating, um, including an assisted vacuum delivery and episiotomy. Um, and it made for a really long uh, recovery as well. And I had also had an epidural at that point. And when I think about um, Sarah talking about the physical changes and um, considerations postpartum of activities, I felt that epidural spot in my low back um, doing activities for about six to nine months after delivering. And it affected how I could participate in activities. 
All that to say, we were so thankful and grateful at that point to welcome our little baby girl, Willow, on May 7, 2020, and all of the emotions leading up to it was, was certainly worth it, um, but they say that, you know, it really begins when you welcome your newborn, and all of the nine months uh, into that really then just, you know, shifted uh, the day we met her and how our lives kind of changed after that. And then I entered uh, into what um, a lot of people call the fourth trimester. Um, and so that is really the transitional period between birth and 12 weeks postpartum, during which, you know, newborn is adjusting to the outside world. And at the same time, me as a mother, my support partner um, are adjusting to baby as well. Um, and it's just such a big transitional period. Um, and it was interesting when I was looking up the term postpartum online, just to see, you know, what's, uh, what the basic definition is. I was really, um, really surprised to see uh, that the, the WHO, World Health Organization, coins postpartum as one of the most important but neglected times in a, a person's life because there are so many changes, but, you know, you get so much support during pregnancy and labor and delivery, and then all of a sudden your life completely shifts and you are on your own with a newborn uh, having to care for this, this little thing that is so reliant on you. Well, at the same time, you know, I was trying to take care of myself and particularly for my labor and delivery story. Um, I, yeah, it was a long recovery for me. So so um, that fourth trimester, the first, you know, three months after, after delivery is such a crucial point and so many changes happening then. So physically, I was exhausted. I did have that kind of, you know, first couple of days are very exciting, getting to know this little one, and then the fatigue sits in, uh, sets in. Um, and I was uncomfortable, again, based on uh, how my delivery went. There was lots of, you know, a lot my body feeling uncomfortable. And I was definitely proud of my body and what I, you know, what I had just gone through and um, what I had, yeah, welcomed into this world. But I was also unsure, what am I capable of doing now? Um, what physically can I do? What emotionally, mentally can I um, uh, engage in? And the, the roller coaster of emotions was just amplified by a thousand postpartum. Um, and in that time, I did, you know, experience some anxiety and some of the blues, just uh, wanting to be so excited, but also just so overwhelmed with all of the changes. I had to keep the news off because, again, the global pandemic was going on at this time. And, you know, you watch the news every day and you just see all of the, the you know, scary things happening in the world. And that's all you hear about. Um, and at that time, you know, connection, support, and love were just so important to me um, to be able to take care of myself, to take care of my little baby, and also, yeah, to support my partner as well. In those first three months, what I did was a lot of walking, and I have there my types of activities, walking and talking, walking and talking, and more walking and talking. The connection piece was so big at that point, trying to unpack what I had just gone through, what I'm going through, um, and doing it with other fellow moms, friends, family members, really just whoever I could connect with um, was very important for me. And I just wanted to note that uh, that top photo there, that's uh, me, my husband and our dog. And that was the first walk that I went for um, after delivery. And that was almost two weeks after delivery. And I kid you not, it was a 10 minute walk and I was exhausted by the end. And I, I got back in the house and I just started crying because I was like, I had never experienced that before of just that total fatigue, again, coming in as a very healthy person, spent my whole life being active. A 10 minute walk completely took the wind out of my sails and it was just completely overwhelming. Um, but then throughout, you know, throughout those following three months, was able to build up my endurance as my body felt better, as uh, my emotions and um, my mental my mental health started to uh, improve as well. So beyond the fourth trimester, what did that look like? Here you'll just see a bunch of photos of all the activities that we really have engaged in over you know the past. My daughter's now a year and a half, so over the past year. And when I talk about the shift in identity. It really comes down to, you know, the activities that we were doing before I was doing a lot of individual solo activities. And now it was all about what's successful for 
me, my child, and my family. Um, so I'll just say that physically, um, I started to feel, you know, I was tired again, still lack of sleep, all of those things, but starting to feel a bit more energetic, um, understanding my new abilities, uh, accepting my new body and this new version of myself. And really, uh, and such an important part of that was has been listening to my body um, and doing activities that really serve both my physical body and my, you know, my mental and emotional health as well. As you can see, there are lots of different activities that we've engaged in and different than what I was doing really prior to, to having our daughter. Um, and one of the things I've really noticed is, you know, um, time spent with grandparents as well, because that's a big shift too. And so here we are, you know, at the park on the swings with grandparents, uh, out for hikes, out for bikes. Um, also going to places like museums, libraries, outdoor markets, um, a lot of the things that I ne not, wasn't necessarily doing before, but wanted to make time for with my child. So when I talked about who I was before, um, this has really given me the opportunity to really think like, who am I now? Uh, because it has been such a shift. And you may look at this photo and think, oh, she's a golfer now. There I am with a few friends on the golf course. But actually that photo was taken two, about two months ago. And that was my first time ever playing golf at a fantastic opportunity. It was a try it day for ladies. So it was about $20. So we got to play nine holes, uh, best ball, a very low stress, fun environment for uh, women to try golf. Um, and, and so this photo doesn't really represent me playing golf and trying it, but it represents one of the really important conversations that I was having with my fellow uh, mom friends, friends um, on the golf course. And we were talking about what are my hobbies now and acknowledging, you know, that our, our partners, our, our husbands have all these hobbies that are their very own. But with this major life shift, my hobbies have completely changed. And, and we joked, we're like, well, what is it doing the laundry, cleaning, cooking, are those are those going to be my hobbies for life now? But really needing to reflect on, okay, how do I gain that sense of independence back? Um, and really what Sarah was speaking to as well, um, who I was before, but acknowledging that I'm not the same as I was before, I have been changed through this. Um, but how can I find my new normal? And I really liked this graphic of personal identity because I think motherhood and parenthood for a lot of people, you know, is a whole uh, change in personal identity. And it's not just that you're taking care of another little human. Um, everything changes from, you know, my interests, my habits, uh, my physical features, body again has totally changed through this process. What are my dreams? What are my values? I'm not just thinking about myself anymore. I'm thinking about our family um, and you know how that all impacts my engagement in sport, physical activity and recreation. And of course, for um, a, a woman too, thinking about career, I took a year maternity leave and it just is an interesting place to be to think about what is my career trajectory now and thinking about the flexibility needed um, if I have to go pick up my child from childcare and all of these different things. So, so many competing uh, priorities and, and expectations and interests. So what I want to share with you, because I believe, I really do truly believe that um, sports, physical activity and recreation leaders are in such a important, critical place to be able to provide programs that support pre postnatal people. And, you know, there's, there's so much that can be offered because it is such a critical time in someone's life. Um, what I've outlined here are some of the challenges, again, that I've personally faced that I know are common and I'm probably missing some challenges that other people face. But then I also want to, for each challenge, offer some ideas and opportunities of how program leaders um, can meet um, some of these challenges. So one of the biggest ones being time and competing priorities. My time is no longer my time alone anymore. I'm constantly thinking about my daughter and my family and all of the things we have on the go. So some ideas to support that for programs is offering shorter program durations. Previous to um, having my daughter, I was doing classes, um, you know, recreation fitness classes that were typically an hour in length. And when you factor in travel time to from, it's a lot. And so even 30 to 45 minutes, making it shorter, but still really making the use of that time is a, one idea. Also offering flexible drop-in programs that are non-committal. Um, I have a story of when my daughter was uh, about 
last um, seven months. We did swimming lessons. We were actually able to get into them last winter. Um, and uh, it was her second swimming lesson. And um, she was having her nap right before the lesson. And I was preparing food. And I cut my finger fairly severely. Um, and I needed to get stitches. But I was at home alone with my daughter. And we couldn't go to the program because there was, you know, we just can't. And things changed. And I couldn't go with her the following week either um, because I still couldn't be in water with the stitches that I had. So um, I wasn't able to attend, uh, you know, out of the, the eight, the eight week program, a couple of those, but having the flexibility and, you know, the option to either drop in or to come as needed is a really uh, great idea. Also involving, um, child and family within, uh, programs and offering childcare, which I know Sarah spoke to as well. That's really important. Um, if, you know, able to do a program and then there's childcare right there as well. So, you know, your, your child is being taken care of while, um, parents can focus on their, their activity. Shifting identity as the next challenge, which has been the big theme here. Um, and some ideas that I've come up with are try it opportunities. For example, that golf one was really great. So uh, of course that one was still fairly time intensive. Um, but, you know, try it opportunities for, you know, me to figure out, okay, now what, what can work, what, what physically will feel good for me, what, you know, will support my mental and emotional health as well. Um, and also multi-sport um, multi-sport or multi-activity, uh, try it program. So, you know, if we thinking about say an eight week program once a week, um, and each week you try something new and that's maybe a, a new way to get people to, uh, find something that they really connect with intergenerational programs. I really like this idea because I think of now just uh, different ways in which I interact with my parents and, you know, Willow is interacting with her grandparents and how it's getting them active too, right? Going out for walks and playing at the park and doing a number of these different things. So is there an opportunity to create intergenerational programs and also programs for partners? And I think about just the, the identity shift that my husband has had becoming a father. And I've heard of dad groups and whatnot, or, you know, support partner groups, because it's, it's big changes and I don't think we always um, acknowledge all the shifts that they might be experiencing as well. Isolation, that's definitely huge, especially in those early few months when, you know, partner might be back to work or if you're home alone or whatever that might be with baby. And yeah, just how important the social component is to be able to reach out through uh, mom partner groups um, within those groups. Also, you know, having time, just informal time to chat. So maybe it's a it's an activity program, but really the first 10 minutes is just to allow people to talk to each other. Um, share their experiences, troubleshoot problems that they might be facing, all of that. And then also finding alternative ways to reach out. Uh, we know that with uh, COVID and the pandemic, it's harder to do things in person. So what are some virtual opportunities? Um, and again, looking at the different environments too, that those uh, programs can be offered. Uh, I think we all know the benefits of being outdoors um, and just that effect that nature has. And as Sarah had said, you know, going for a walk with baby, that's also really soothing for, it can be really soothing for baby as well. So thinking about um, the environments that uh, programs are offered in. Of course, the challenge of all the mental and physical changes. So I think it's really important uh, when running programs to have certified pre postnatal specialists who understand these changes. Um, and uh, as Michelle was talking about, you know, understanding the guidelines and also, you know, some of the contraindications, all of those pieces is really important. Um, also thinking about the intensity of programs, and this has already been talked about um, in terms of, you know, shifting from maybe more intense programs to a more moderate, lighter, something that's going to, yeah, meet the needs of those physical and mental changes. And again, with just such a big life change and, you know, a lot of the time questioning, am I doing this right? Am I, um, am I supporting my child in the best way possible? Um, offering a lot of affirmations, encouragement, and support that I think is such a big part um, in creating those programs and having that, uh, that brought into them. In terms of accessibility, I didn't realize how inaccessible and challenging sidewalks could be until I started pushing a stroller. Um, and that's just one, that's just one area, right? But um, if we're thinking about programs um, and inviting, you know, uh, women with, or people who are bringing their, their children and pushing strollers, is it stroller accessible? Also, is it accessible for breastfeeding if that is what the, uh, the parent is choosing to do? 
Um, is there a comfortable place to be able to breastfeed baby if needed? And also bathrooms. I think that's uh, the accessibility of bathrooms is important. So during pregnancy, um, when there can be a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on the bladder, and a, a lot of women have to go to the bathroom more frequently, um, is there a bathroom that can be easily um, accessed? And also postpartum as well, with incontinence being a, a big issue for some people as well. And then also for diaper changes, of course. So if you know baby has a, a big diaper change, and do I have a place to be able to do that at that program? And then finally, finances, again, uh, you know, such a such a life shift. And then not only thinking about, OK, how am I supporting myself uh, through a life, but also baby now and in the future or child now in the future and so much more to consider. So I think, um, you know, looking at fee structure and low cost program options are, are really important to just be able to support um, mom and uh, parents in being able to access programs. And this is the last piece of advice I can leave you with. Um, at the end of the day, if you are developing adjusting programs, please involve people with lived experience in the uh, development of the programs. Having the input, again, this is only my one person's unique journey through pregnancy and postpartum, uh, but it's, I think, really important when running programs and developing just to have some input on what needs to be considered. Um, and I love the saying, nothing for me without me. So I hope that provides a, a bit of food for thought as you um, go on your program development and deliveries. So thank you so much for following and supporting our journey. Again, thank you to the CPRA for inviting me to share this really personal journey. And if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, to ask them now. Thank you.